This chair is basically constructed from material that was intended to be used for the construction of wooden tennis rackets. The seat slats are laminated from seven strips of hornbeam, which came from Europe. It's been sliced, it's very thin. The front legs are laminated from 22 sections, again intended for tennis rackets. These narrow stabilizing bars underneath are laminated from a combination of hornbeam and beech, which was intended for squash rackets. The rear legs here are constructed of seven strips of rock maple, the same maple they get the sugar syrup from, laminated up on jigs. And the inspiration behind this chair was just a, de a desire to use this unique material which I obtained from a tennis racket factory down in Durban to use this material to its best best advantage, I suppose, the best way I can put it. And uh, this, is, this is the result. I have made other things which are not on this exhibition using this in laminated form and bending it. These jigs here we used to construct the chair that I've just described. And their function is probably quite obvious to you. The multiple strips of timber are placed in there with glue between them. These coils are placed over, then this is cramped. The end result being the strips and drew glue dries and you end up with curved members which make the chair you've just seen. This large jig here was used to laminate up the back legs. This is a set of stabilizing arms. Yeah. All right, here are two more jigs. Again, used in the construction of that chair. This large one here used to laminate the seat members. It's the most complicated jig used in this project. This smaller one here used to laminate up the front legs. Quite a simple little jig. They are quite highly finished. And the reason for that is, in doing so, when you strip the jig down and take out your laminated member, all the squeezed out glue is very easy to remove from the jig and comes off. Right, here is another chair, very similar to the one I described earlier, but quite a few factors make it different. Uh, the first one you saw was the prototype. This chair here was, let's say, the production model with some quite major alterations which may not be initially obvious to you. These legs on this, the production model, are much wider apart at the bottom and closer together at the top, giving, I think, a more elegant appearance to the whole piece. While this cross member here, linking the two rear legs, is a good deal higher off the ground than the prototype, adding more strength to the basic uh, structure of the, well, the, the way that this design functions. The chair can flex, as uh, the heavier you are, obviously the more it flexes. This one is finished with a, with a lacquer finish. The previous one you saw was just raw wood. Still. As one can see, these laminated strips go up in a joint and you have a curve here, basically a compound curve to accommodate natural form. Quite tricky to then glue down up at the top here. This top joint here, this top member is joined to the top of the legs with what is known as a bridle joint. In fact, it is not a cabinet making joint, it is a carpenter's joint, but is highly effective in, in, in use in this, in this instance. These stools are constructed from aeroply, laminated into this curve, and Oregon pine. The inspiration was watching someone sitting uncomfortably 
at a fireplace, stoking it on a, on a very inappropriate stool. I thought, no, I could do better than that. As you can see, this is basically tubular. Triangles are wonderful things to use in a design sense. Extremely strong. This plywood comes from Finland and as I said, aero ply used for aircraft construction. The seats. There's very little waste material in the making up of this seat. As you can see, there are three members. And in fact, they are cut from one plank. That piece slides in there. That piece slides in there. So basically, this is cut from a triangular plank, which has already been laminated up. The grain is aligned so that basically you have the equivalent of a quarter sawn plank for stability. Oregon, with its marked grain lends itself very well to such a design and construction. This, trophy, this cabinet here is used to, well, was made and designed to house the trophy for the first woman home in the Comrades Marathon, which is one of the world's great long distance races. People coming from all over the world to partake. It's, I think, in about its 80th year. And they were, these trophies were extremely mundanely housed in the museum of the Comrades Marathon, which is here in Peter Maritzburg, and I decided we could do better than that. This is the result. This glass was curved, bent in Cape Town. Um, this trunk is constructed of laminated strips, sheets of aero ply, maple blocks. This, in fact, is made of one piece of wood that's been cut up. It may not seem apparent, but that, those two bits of wood are continuous. Ash, the lid, which is removed via a mechanism inside. This is the front of the cabinet. There's the rear. There's a door at the rear, which allows one access. This, once unlocked, is able to be lifted off access gain trophy. The base of this trophy cabinet is constructed entirely out of indigenous Southern African hard pear, a linear ventosa. As you can see, that eye in the wood and that eye in the wood, call them knots, uh, are not at random. They, that, that piece of wood was growing there and split and the entire base is made like that. This timber here, this light timber, is from the same plank. It's one of the delights of using our indigenous timbers. They, they are very different to our, how can I say, our more predictable woods which we use, which come from overseas. It's very hard, beautiful, and a pleasure to use. This chair is constructed out of solid sneezewood, barring the rear legs which are laminated strips of sneezewood to get the curve. A very hard, tough wood, extremely beautiful. This particular timber came from the Ngeli forests in southern Natal and there's an awful lot of work in sculpting this seat. If I tip it over you'll be able to see the contours involved here but the effort is worth it. It finishes beautifully with a faint smearing of wax polish. In 14 years this has been polished three times and it has a quite a superb pattern and finish on it now. In the construction three mortars and tenon joints are used in many places. As you can see here they are wedged these three mortars and tenons with ebony wedges for strength and of course there is a decorative element to employing that, that method. I date all my work and the stuff made of the indigenous woods. I give the description, the, if, the scientific name of the timber onto the piece as you can see there and the year. Uh, 
I even forget myself when I make these, when I have made these pieces, and it's it's nice to have a reference to see when when they were actually made. The idea for this bench was in my head for about 20 years before I finally got down to thinking about how I'd make it constructed. And it was a lovely challenge. Initially when I started, I didn't know how I was going to conquer all the technical difficulties, but the technology evolves with the project. It is made of extremely thin, finish aero ply. This is only three millimeters thick and the construction is rather similar to the way a boat would be made. There are straight grain Oregon pine stringers behind here at each joint. These two legs were constructed in a very strong steel jig and there are about not about, there are, there are 10 1.5 millimeter sheets of aeroply curved here. It forms a very strong structure. The seat of the bench is constructed of strips of quarter sawn Oregon pine, orientated in an acceptable manner. Underneath it is a more substantial structure of uh, maple and plywood. Because this piece is hollow and airtight, it was necessary to have a breather or some breather holes in order for air to escape or enter the piece as atmospheric pressure changed, otherwise it would eventually self-destruct due to the pressures involved. The problem was, where do you drill a hole into a piece made of lightly coloured wood where it's not obvious. Well the solution was quite simple. My ebony name plug here has ten little holes drilled in it allowing air to enter and leave. And uh, it seems to have been very successful. I've always wanted to make one of these large scarf joints, which of course have nothing to do with furniture building, but were uh, timber framers methods of lengthening bits of timber. It's an ingenious method of doing so, dating back to the medieval period, a thousand years ago. As you can see, this top piece hooks into the corner of this lower piece here, and the lower piece hooks into the corner of this top piece and there is a step here in the joint. They are thrust apart by these two wedges of very hard panga panga and makes for a very strong structure. It can easily support my weight. The tabletop is constructed out of end grain as you can see there are in excess of 250 blocks of wood here, arranged with no, with no pattern in mind, just randomly arranged, I should say. The effect is very striking. An awful lot of finishing and planing is required to arrive at this flat surface. And the legs are also out of the same timber. This table has had 15 years of continuous use in the kitchen and has stood up very well to practical use. This period piece, bureau bookcase, um, I was making about 25 years ago. A tricky piece to make in that these doors are made in the traditional Georgian method whereby these little pieces of wood, this astragal moulding as it is called, you're joining end grain and all these points, which of course any woodworkers seeing this will know is not common practice. 
However, if your joints are close fitting and using a good glue, it is possible as you can see. This picture frame constructed out of sneeze wood. As you can see this magnificent ripple in this lower section. This timber actually came from the Ngeli forests, southern Natal. Sadly, as a material it was almost never used by the colonials and even up till even at present really as a timber it's extremely hard it's not available commercially but nevertheless its, its potential has never really been explored the plant depicted here was discovered by my grandfather Mr. Crundle about 75 years ago in the Sotpansberg Mountains up in the northern part of the country.